Hi everybody, thanks for coming out for the talk. Uh, I'm going to talk today about user management and user support and as a kind of a hook into that I'm going to talk about what would you do to deal with adversity which users can provide by the way. What would you do to deal with adversity if you were in the Roman military circa the early part, uh, uh, early years of the um, AD period, okay? Uh, by the way, anybody who's down there and feels like they'd rather be up here, I was kind of expecting a smaller group, so if you want to get more intimate and come upstairs, go ahead, don't worry about inter interrupting the flow of the talk. I, I don't know if there's enough seats. Yeah, there may not be enough seats up here, so wherever you're comfortable is good. All right, um, so how many here have ever supported, yes? Well, I was just going to ask, uh, I missed Oh yes, that's a company I have with my brother. He's in Arkansas. I'm in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, we do support for Silicon Valley startups, uh, and uh, so alpha testing, beta testing, all that. I was going to pip myself at the end, but that's okay. I'll I'll do both. I'll bracket both ends of it. Do a little self promotion. Um, so, um, who here has ever supported a user of something? Oh wow, okay. Uh, every day, okay. Yeah. Every workday, every work day, sure. Yo, who here has ever supported a user as your every day work day kind of job, like your main kind of thing? Okay, right? Who here has supported a user who is a relative or a friend? Yes, we all, we all have, right? Okay. Well, so um, we know that supporting users is fraught with adversity. It is a difficult task. It can try a person's patience especially technical people like us, not to include all of you, but like my tribe, technical people don't have a lot of ingrained patience. What do you do if you're not the kind of person who was born with a large reserve of patience? There's a trick that you can do. You can cultivate it. You can learn it. You can learn it just like when the, you first learned how to type. It was very frustrating because you didn't know where the keys were. You can learn how to work with obnoxious, difficult, uh, privileged users just like learning the type where it becomes second nature where it's not a big deal and it just kind of happens okay what do Roman centurions have to do with this bear with me around the time of uh, the birth of Jesus Christ to about 200 years later there were about four main schools of philosophy in ancient Rome Epicureanism cynicism skepticism and stoicism each of these have root words that have become in part of the English language and you can kind of take a guess at what each one of them means although the fact is that each one means a little bit different than the root word that you're seeing here you might think of an Epicurean as somebody who's really into good food and wine and the pleasures of the, of the flesh a cynic is someone who thinks that things will never change a skeptic doesn't believe things a stoic what does a stoic do a stoic takes adversity when in silence, suffers maybe without complaining, right? Well, that's only half the story. That's how it looks like the Stoic is doing, what the, what the Stoic is doing, but he's actually maybe doing something different. I'm going to talk about the Stoics because their philosophy is the most useful when you're working with users because the Stoics understand and studied how to work through suffering, how to deal with adverse conditions how to put up with yahoos. This is not to say users are yahoos or insufferable or anything like that. No, we value users, we love them. They are our customers, our friends, our moms. The fact is they can be a challenge to work with. And in the time when users become those needy users that we really would rather not have to support all the time is the time when we need an ability to deal with adversity, the kind of ability that the Stoics provide. There were three main Stoic um, thinkers whose uh, work is still with us today that you, would, uh, that you might learn about in school if you go to school for philosophy. There was um, Seneca. Seneca was a statesman and a tutor, an important bigwig kind of a guy. Um, he wrote letters to a friend uh, telling that friend how to deal with adversity, how to be a virtuous person, how to live a good life in the Stoic tradition. Those letters we still have today. There was Epictetus. He ran a school, uh, a literal school, an actual place where students would come, teenagers mostly, young men would be sent by their fathers to learn 
philosophy from Epictetus. He was also born a slave, raised up in, uh, came up in rank, became a free person, and then was exiled out of Rome and no longer part of the mainstream when the political forces turned against him. Marcus Aurelius, did anyone here seen the movie The Gladiator? Marcus Aurelius was the old guy at the beginning, was the emperor, played by Harris, I think was his name, um, not sure, but um, he was an emperor, he was literally, when he lived, he was the most powerful person on the planet at that time, bar none, and he was a devout Stoic. To show you what a good Stoic he was, he cared so much about it that free of charge, he offered three days of lectures on Stoic philosophy to anybody who wanted to show up in Rome before he shipped out to Germ the Germanic lands to try to put down some kind of uprising, and, uh, which is a main job of an emperor to maintain the military integrity, the, the uh, security of the empire. So uh, he was very committed to it. We have his writings because um, he was um, writing to himself. He had a habit, which is a, a, a meditation habit, of writing out things that he knew to be true to help him basically get through the day, get through the week. I'm going to talk primarily, though, about Epictetus because uh, he was actually a teacher. This was his job. He wasn't, uh, we don't, we, what we have from him is not actually a textbook he wrote, but we have lecture notes. A guy named Aaron at about 100 AD wrote down what he was saying, and out of that we have two books. We have the Discourses, which is him going back and forth with his students, giving lectures, and we have the Handbook. And the Handbook is sort of a, um, a boiling down of all the key concepts that Aaron learned from Epictetus into one very simple volume. And that's what I'm going to draw on today when we learn about taking care of users. Why? Because this is a book that Roman soldiers, centurions for example, would take into battle because they knew they were going to face adversity. They were fighting, they were going to die, a lot of them. Most centurions died in service. They were the lowest ranking people who were literate for the most part and they knew how to read and they took a book with them to kind of get them through it. Just like someone today who's a devout Christian or Jew might take uh, the Bible, the Torah, something like that to give them comfort. This is what they brought and it was very small. In fact, it all fits on one page translated into English. So right now I'm going to arm you the same way the centurions were armed by handing out a few copies of the handbook. I'm sorry, I was expecting a much smaller crowd. Last time I gave this talk, I didn't give it as jazzy a title. And so now you're all the victims of marketing. And I apologize. And I will keep one of these. And um, a good strategy, if you're interested in adopting Stoic philosophy when dealing with adversity in your life, be it users or anything else, is when you encounter adversity, take this out, pick someplace at random. If it's too small, you'll need a magnifying glass or to print it out at a bigger resolution, and start reading until you feel better. That's always a strategy that's worked for me. Here's the most important thing that Epictetus put into this handbook used by Roman soldiers. He said, all things are divided in the two parts. There are those things that are within our power and there are those things that are outside of our power. For example, when you park your car today, you have the power to determine where do you park your car. You do not have the power to determine whether a meter maid uh, attendant will come by and cite you or your car will be towed away. You do not have the power to determine whether yahoos will bust out your windows. Uh, but you do have the power to decide to leave your car at home, okay? Now that only works so far. The thing that Epictetus was really trying to get at is you have the power when yahoos break the windows out of your new Corvette, you can either decide to get worked up about it, to get upset, to be bothered, to be annoyed, or you can decide to accept things philosophically and say, this is what happens to Corvettes sometimes. Yahoos break out the windows and I'm not going to get all upset about it. We'll go through about five different examples of specifics of how this works out and how we can use the fact that all things are divided into two parts, those that are in our power and those outside our power, and see how they can apply to user support situations. By the way, here's this exact same thing in uh, the ancient Greek. If you know ancient Greek, you might want to copy that down quick. The first thing to remember, and by the way, I'm, each of these comes from part of the handbook, and on the sheet I've had, I'm sorry, again, apologize, there's not enough of them. 
um, in the section, usually at the top of that section, is found the verse that I'm quoting. The first thing that Epictetus tells us is, and when you're going to take uh, any kind of action, if you're going to do anything, remind yourself what kind of an action it is, what kind of act it is. For example, if you're going to the baths, know what to expect. Now, everybody in Rome who was anybody went to the baths. They didn't take baths at home, they went to the baths, which is like the health club, right? What do you expect at the baths? Okay, people are going to shove you. People are going to steal your things if they get the chance. People are going to be rude to you. Um, he didn't say this, but you know, they might not have any towels, right? The water might not be warm enough, or could be too warm. These are the kinds of problems you have to expect. Put this in the context of a user. If you're in a situation where you have to talk to a user, and by the way, I think most of the people in this room are the people who talk to users when things get bad, right? When things are not being handled by the usual methods of user support, and the, <laughs> the big dog has to come in and fix something, right? What do you expect? Why don't you just go ahead and expect that that user is going to be pissed off? that user is going to be angry. If you're at PayPal, you can expect that user's account has been locked and a great disservice has been done to him. He's going to write to uh, Meg Whitman and his congressman and take his business elsewhere and he is going to call you every name in the book and in a way your organization might deserve it, right? Remember that before you even pick up the call, before you start reading your email, remember people are going to be pissed off at you. From Number 16 on the handbook, we learn that we should empathize, but we shouldn't internalize. So if something bad is happening to somebody, you should lament with him, but take care that you do not lament internally also. In other words, extend your sympathy, but don't join in the suffering. So, for example, John, do you have a Corvette? The older, John has a newer Corvette. So John, if you went out today with me after this conference, we were going to walk over and, and get a beer or something like that, and we saw your Corvette had been beat to shit, what would we say about that? You would probably be pretty upset, right? Okay, now I'm a Stoic, or a student of Stoic philosophy, so I'm not really going to care what the hell happened to your Corvette. I mean, in a sense, right? All the things being equal, I would like John's Corvette to be unmolested. But in light of the fact that the, all the windows have been broken out, I'm still going to be okay with that. I'm not approving of it, I'm withholding judgment, but I'm also going to empathize with John. When your user calls and says, I got hit with five overdraft charges because you kept trying to charge my account, is that our fault? No, afraid not. Almost certainly that is the user's fault, right? But do you tell the user that? And do you refrain from offering any kind of sympathy? No, you say, I'm so sorry to hear that. I, I wish this wouldn't have, this is awful what's happened. And at the same time, you don't take the blame. You express your sympathy even though, do you really care? No, because if you had to care every time a user had a problem, at the end of the day, you would be emotionally drained. Don't, don't do that. On number 15, we mentioned patience. This, this one's very important. Remember that in life, you ought to behave as at a banquet. What does he mean by that? He means that if you're sitting down to a meal with um, important people, probably, because they were the ones that threw banquets back then, and they still do, do you see the pork roast at the other end of the table and say, oh, I gotta get me some of that, and jump right up, run over and grab it? No, I mean, maybe you would under certain circumstances, but for the most part you don't. You sit back and you wait for the pork roast to be passed to you, okay? This is how you need to look at life. Um, if you see a great opportunity, or you see some um, injustice being done, something that needs to be fixed, something you want, something you want to see happen, go after it, in a sense, but also be ready to sit back, have patience, wait for the opportunity, right? This is, this is much more easy to do and much more satisfying than getting all bent out of shape and jumping up and going after a problem. Did you find a bug in the code that's fouling up the users and the users are calling and blaming you for it? Yeah, well, we all have, right? What do you do about that? Do you get upset? Do you call the developers right away? Do you storm into some sort of product manager's office? Like, keep the guy on hold? No, no. You take down the information, you process it, and in due time, the bug will be fixed. At least in theory, except for when it's not. We'll come to that one next. For right now, look at number 28. This is extremely powerful. 
Epictetus asked his students, he did this a lot, he would ask his students things in a kind of in the Socratic method. Socrates is a guy he admired a lot, but Socrates lived 500 years before Epictetus, so it'd be like us admiring Christopher Columbus. We don't know a lot about him, right? But he used uh, Socrates' method of asking questions. He said to one of his students, would you, um, you would decline to hand your physical self over to those who hate you. Well, why would you hand your mind over to them? Like, if a user call, calls up and calls you every name in the book and complains about you, right? Who here has ever had a complaint from a user? And they took it personally. And your name, I'm sorry. Ryan. Ryan, Ryan, did that user conflate you, Ryan, with the product and the service that you were working to support? To some degree. Yeah, to some degree, right. It wasn't fair. It wasn't right. It's not a good, it's not a good feeling, also, to be blamed for something you didn't do. But how much are you going to invest yourself in their mistake? If I were advising Ryan what to do, I would say, Ryan, listen to this Yahoo on the phone. He's got a point, maybe, but acknowledge it and move on. I think this is sort of like the ancient version of something I've seen on like a bumper sticker. Uh, hatred is letting someone else live rent-free in your head, right? This idea, you're, instead of internalizing that and having at the end of the day thinking about all the people who were very difficult to deal with, acknowledge them, move on, and forget it. Don't hand over your mind to them any more than you'd hand over your body to someone who despises you. This one's also very important, and I think that as technical people we have to examine this a lot. We need to let our mistakes go. If you look at the handbook number 12, he makes the um, analogy of is something bad happen to something that you value. For example, is a little oil spilled, right? Um, I guess oil is, was probably pretty precious back then. Let's say that you had a really nice bottle of wine, right? And you dropped it and it broke and it's ruined. Okay, you lost your bottle of wine. Um, but guess what? Maybe that bottle was worth $50. You know, for me, that's a very expensive wine. I don't know about you people. I try to stay under five if possible. But um, if you lost a $50 bottle of wine, think about that. Think about what you lost and react in proportion. Don't get all upset because your day got ruined by something bad that happened. You made a mistake, okay? Right, you let the wine bottle drop. You fell on the concrete. You're out $50 worth of wine. Guess what? You're only out $50 worth of wine. Don't turn it into a $500 problem or a $5,000 problem. Don't make it into something where you come home and you're pissed off at your wife and your kids and your dog and your husband and your mother-in-law for no reason. Make it something where you only react with uh, a proportion to the value of the thing that you lost. Same with your own mistakes at work. We all make mistakes at work. We introduce bugs. We tell users the wrong answers. We uh, configure things incorrectly. Everybody does. We reboot the wrong server. Has anybody ever rebooted the wrong server? Oh, man. I was just reading something once years ago about somebody rebooting the wrong server, and I thought to myself, that yuts. How could he possibly reboot the wrong server? Not, not a week later, it must have been karma, I rebooted the wrong server. So... Um, but uh, guess what, I forgave myself. I, at the price of tranquility, I let that go. And that's good advice. Don't be angry with the engineers. Now, I should really change that. I shouldn't say don't be angry with the engineers. It's like, don't be really angry at the engineers. Don't carry a grudge to the in, about the, the engineers. Accept the fact that you have the engineers, you have the code base, you have the management that you have. Accept that. Okay? If you don't want to accept it and you can change it, for example, can you get another job? Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Explore that. Don't explore stewing about the fact that the management are idiots, that the engineers are incompetent, that the investors are impatient. Whatever it is, let that go. That's all outside of you. Don't bother trying to change it. Don't even think about it. Just remember that you shouldn't seek to um, things, make things happen as you wish. But you should just wish that things will happen as they are. And then you'll just have a tranquil flow of life. Yeah? I think that sounds like a much better idea. Is it going to fix the problems? No, but you know what else isn't going to fix, about, fix those problems? Getting an ulcer. Also not going to fix the problems. So to recap what we talked about, 
Epictetus explains that if we're going to do good customer support, we should first set our mind right at the start. When we start, understand what we're getting into each workday. We should empathize with users who have problems, but we shouldn't internalize them. Their problems are their problems, not ours. We need to have patience uh, and wait for the opportunity to make solutions happen. We better decline to deliver our mind over to others. Don't let people live rent-free rent -free in your head. Be easy on yourself. Let your mistakes go. And don't carry a grudge about those idiot engineers, OK? You know, if things go well, you might be an idiot engineer someday, if that's what you ascribe to, or an idiot manager, or an idiot shareholder, or something like that. Put yourself in, in their shoes. Understand the situation from the other side. And then live your life without a lot of regrets, without a lot of concern, and without a lot of angst about things that you cannot control. It leaves more time for moving on to the things that you can. A few resources besides what I gave you right there. You might remember um, about 10, 15 years ago, there was a best-selling book called A Man in Full by Tom Wolfe. Very good book. I recommend it. Uh, it's about the two main characters who come to Stoic philosophy and find a place for it in their lives in an unexpected way. Um, Vice Admiral James Bond Stockdale, he was a um, fighter pilot in the Vietnam War, who was shot down, spent eight years in a Vietnamese prison camp, much worse than any call center, I assure you. Uh, and he used Stoic philosophy as his way of coping and getting through uh, what was seemingly an unmanageable situation. And um, Tony Long, uh, Anthony Long, is an author of some books where you can learn more about uh, kind of Epictetus and the other Stoics from the philosophical standpoint. I uh, recommend that a lot if you're interested in getting to know more about the technical aspects of philosophy, which there are, which is a strange thing to say. But um, how much time do we have? Oh, we're almost out of time. Uh, can I ask if anybody has questions? Please come to me right away. But first, let me ask questions for questions about um, customer support. Because my company, Good Use Sumner, we've been doing customer support, coordinating alpha and beta testing, fielding questions from users, email, not a lot of phone calls, but that was something I did a lot at PayPal. Um, if you have any questions about technical support and just support in general, ask me now or catch me later. I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Anybody have anything? Anybody want to share a tech support horror story? Everyone has uh, set their minds right and doesn't have them anymore. That's awesome. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.